The suicide crisis in Attawapiskat has brought new attention to the remote northern Ontario community. This week alone, nine more suicide attempts were reported, prompting the Prime Minister to accept an invitation to meet with the Chief. Adrian Sutherland grew up there. Now he's the CEO for Economic Development, a paramedic, a father of four, and a musician. I play acoustic guitar and I'm the lead singer in the band Midnight Shine. In 2011, Canadian rockers Trooper invited Sutherland to open a show in Timmins, Ontario. He pulled together three friends, all James Bay Cree, to form a band, and Midnight Shine was born. The music is inspired by the likes of Neil Young. Keep me searching for a heart of gold. But also explores their indigenous identity. Hey -yo, hey -yo, hey -yo. The band is creating a buzz. In February, a major label scooped them up. And this weekend, they are headlining at the legendary Horseshoe Tavern, where the Rolling Stones once played. For Midnight Shine, it's an opportunity to prove there is good music and some positive stories coming out of Attawapiskat. I met up with Adrian Sutherland and bassist Stan Luteet just before one of their big shows in Toronto. So nice to meet you. Hi. Yeah, hi. Hi. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. How's, it, how's it feel? You're part of Canadian Music Week. It's a big deal for yeah. us. Very big deal. It's, uh, well, even back home uh, on our Facebook page and our website, we're just getting so much traffic. Uh, they're very proud of us to see that we're, you know, f from a very isolated area going into uh, an industry down here. You guys don't get together very often. You live we, too far apart. <laughs> we, we have, uh, we're not a typical band, I guess. Uh, we're in the James Bay area and we come from Moose Factory, Adrian comes from Attawapiskat, and George comes from Fort Albany, so we're kind of in different places. When we get together, we really try to make it gel fast. How hard was it to get everyone together for this? Uh, Stan May had the, the biggest challenge. He had, to, uh, he had to charter a helicopter off the island where he lives to get across to the mainland to catch his flight. And you came by snowmobile part? Oh, yeah, I was at camp uh, a couple of weeks ago and you know participating in the annual goose hunt and I had to cut that short to get home so I I would travel across sea ice on the bay uh, by snow machine to get home so that... Uh, How long a journey is that? Usually two days um, and this time of year it's a bit uh, not as safe because you're kind of weaving your way through water and all sorts of other uh, uh, I guess dangers but um, We've been well trained uh, to be out there in the sea ice by our elders, so we know what to, to look for. So how do you, if it's so hard to get together, how do you guys, how do you practice? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> we spend a lot of time on our own playing. Uh, me, as a, as a songwriter, I'm always trying to write and develop my craft and get better at it. Whenever we have shows, typically we, we arrive a few days early and we, we just, you know, we will rehearse everything and get it down as best we can so we can put on the best show we can uh, for, for the people we're playing for. That's historically how we've done it so far and it's worked. So I don't want to call you guys trendy or anything, but it does seem as if Indigenous music is getting a lot more attention lately, Tanya Tagak and uh, A Tribe Called Red. So are you just getting more attention finally or, or what is it? I think it's just, uh, it's an interesting time uh, uh, for us, uh, First Nations, to be heard and uh, I think certainly as artists we think we have a voice now and we have a platform where we can invite people in to have a conversation because uh, some of the writing is a little bit politically driven and, but not so much on the nose where it kind of turns people off. nice to see a happy story out of Attawapiskat. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I think there, I mean, we're one good story, I think, uh, 
um, from the north. I think there are a lot of other good things happening there. Um, you know, the harvest is, is a huge, the, the spring harvest is a huge uh, function for... Of geese? Or? Yeah, geese, caribou, uh, fish, whatever. Um, many families are participating in that, that whole uh, harvest right, right now or just ending it now. And I mean, and there's so much good that can come from that. I, I, you know, from my own experience of uh, taking my family out, uh, the kids, they have so much fun and there's the bonding, the family bonding that happens and the transfer of traditional knowledge that occurs out on the land uh, that would otherwise probably not happen if, if you weren't going out and practicing those things on the land. So. I think there's there's a lot of good things and, and yeah the, I mean quite often it's depicted as uh, dark and, and uh, troubled uh, yes the, the, there are issues and we're very aware of them and we we uh, care very deeply about First Nation issues you know, it's uh, it's terrible and you have kids do you sometimes wonder if it's the best place for them you obviously want things to be better well, yeah, I mean, as a parent, you grapple with all sorts of things and you want the best for your children and, and you want to protect them and shield them from, from uh, any, any kind of harm or, or those types of issues. Uh, um, but we do our best to, you know, raise our children and, and leave good examples for them. And <clears throat> that's all you can do, I think, as, as parents. So is this, is your generation, like you guys are obviously doing really well. Is your generation different than the younger generation growing up in Moose Factory and Attawapiskat? Well, I think... Uh, Is it harder for them? <laughs> I, yeah, definitely, because now you have, you have all of these distractions. Um, you have social media and you have, um, you have drug problems that you know, are plaguing the communities. Uh, we, we never experienced any of that growing up. Uh, I know there was a big uh, push for us when, when we were growing up there was a big push for for getting chores done you know and, and, and uh, you had to fill the freezer with meat fish whatever because of the remoteness and uh, no no produce no fresh mm -hmm. fruit nothing like that ever um, so it was very different mm -hmm. I think different for us uh, in the sense that perhaps maybe there were stronger values or maybe we didn't have the distractions that our kids are going through today and, mm -hmm. and some of the some of the not so good things that are coming in like drugs and that sort of thing so being remote was hard but it sounds like access to social media for the young people has its complications too now i think so i think uh, i guess maybe there you know with that there may come negative messages from certain types of media and I think that's something maybe the parents and the schools and, and the teachers that we have in the communities can't always uh, keep track of. Native communities in the north get a lot of attention when things go wrong. Um, you know, reporters fly up and pay attention and then they leave. I mean, what does that feel like? Oh, well, we, I, I have a tough time watching uh, the media when, you know, especially when they talk about my home. I have a tough time reading the commentary, uh, so I don't anymore. Um, it is tough when people come and go, and I think I don't think the answers are, are outside the community. I think the answers lie within the community, and I, I think you know as soon as we can figure out you know how to change things, it's got to happen in in the communities first. Do you see that happening yet? Yes, uh, certainly uh, there is an urgency. Um, people are on edge and, and they do want to see change. I think for sure we need stronger governance in our communities. We need stability um, when it comes to dealing with these, these types of issues. Um, and certainly help from outside agencies is, is, uh, is good. There is a process that started and, and hopefully that process leads to better things. So is Midnight Shine about hope then? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I, we, we don't, we didn't know what we were doing when we first, you know, set out as a band. Uh, I don't think anybody really does, or any any band or any musician. Uh, and I think yes, we want to inspire people. We want to, uh, you know, show people that if you want to pursue something, uh, you know, you can achieve it if mm -hmm. if you work hard at it and you believe in yourself and you surround yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think anything anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Well, best of luck.
Thank you. Thanks.